The Legal Mindset Corner will begin after a brief word from today's sponsor, Answering Legal. Visit AnsweringLegal.com to learn more about our 24-7 virtual receptionist team. I've been utilizing Answering Legal for my firm since 2015, and truth be told, it was a game changer for me. I can be anywhere, and I'm getting my phones answered by Answering Legal. A strategic partner, as I call Answering Legal, provides a great reward. What is that reward? It's time. Time for whatever I want to do. As a private practitioner, I would highly recommend Answering Legal to other private practitioners. Now, every call goes answered. to the Legal Mindset Corner, sponsored by our friends at Answering Legal. Now, my co-host, Becky Hallett, and I, I'm Cynthia Sharp, are devoted to exploring a range of topics that impact lawyer well-being, and that includes mindfulness, work-life integration, digital communication, resilience, healthy communication, and more. Well, today... We are privileged to have our friends, Terry Harrell, Executive Director of Indiana Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program, and Loretta Alexi, Mindful Life and Work Coach with Thought Kitchen. Well, our topic today is near and dear to my heart and to Becky's, and that is the positive impact that pets can have on attorney mental health and really the mental health of anybody. We want to thank both of you for joining our podcast today. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you so much for having us. This is a topic that is also very near and dear to my heart. Absolutely. Well, what a fun and, podcast. And I just want to say we've yeah, and we recently, I just want to give a shout out to you as well, because we recently profiled you in our, in an article. So we have our standing attorney well-being column for the ABA, uh, which we repost on Legal Burnout. And thanks to you both for, I feel like your personal anecdotes and the stories just like put that article over the edge. Uh, it was just so heartwarming. So just a little bit of background about how we kind of came to this. I, I got to say, I'm kind of feeling left out because y'all are all in Indiana right now. And I'm the only one who's in Kansas. <laughs> but we're, ha we're having a virtual Midwest uh, uh, <laughs> coming together. But yeah, so Cindy and I were presenting at the Indiana State Bar uh, Solo and Small Firm Conference. And we, that's where we were interacting with Loretta and Terry and their amazing therapy dogs. So can you both tell us a little bit about your background in that, in that world and your experiences? Sure. Um, so I, I am actually, my necklace that I am wearing today is the dog tag of the, one of the original therapy dogs, Kirby, the best dog ever. So Kirby and I were doing pet therapy at a local hospital when I started to work for JLAP. In my, in my former job, I, I worked with Terry at JLAP. And so when I started to work there, I had Kirby and had a little bit of experience doing pet therapy. And we really started because um, we were going to the law schools trying to talk about mental health and well-being. And when JLAP would set up a table at the law schools, the students would make a big circle around us. So we decided we would start to take the dogs. And Terry had Gus at the time. And the dogs were a big hit. And as you might imagine, students would come up and start to pet the dogs. And then they would start talking about how hard law school was or how they missed their animals from home or what whatever, and it would lead to connection and helping them to understand that JLAP was a safe place. Um, so that's really how it started. And then, and then of course, the attorneys got wind of it and said, well, we want dogs at our conference. And the judges <laughs> said, we want dogs at our conference. And so Kirby and Gus went all over the state to all kinds of audiences. That's so cool. Absolutely. And Terry, did I see from your emails that you you're actually visiting a law school today? 
Sam, my Can current therapy Sam dog. Yes, Samwise and I will be going over to the Maurer Law School about noon today for their well-being fair. Um, yeah, he is a frequent flyer at all the law schools and lots of lawyer and judicial conferences. We visit the Marion County Prosecutor's Office about once a quarter. Um, he has a very busy job as a therapy dog. And I have to thank Loretta. We also, when she came on board, I'd had a previous therapy dog before Gus, and our building manager was kind of, yeah, no, no dogs in the building, no matter what certifications they have. And when Loretta started, she also had a therapy dog. We said, now, wait a minute. And we went back and were persistent about explaining the benefits of it. And he finally agreed that we could have the therapy dogs in the office if we're going to the law school or to a law firm, which made it a whole lot easier for us to go do visits, which was wonderful um, and kind of exploded how often we did it. And we invited some of our volunteers if they have sort of a minimum level of training to have their dogs become JLAP volunteer dogs as well so that we have more dogs to take here and there. And we now have a JLAP staff member who has two therapy dogs. So that helps us pump the numbers up, which is great. Boy, that, that, that's fabulous. And, and now did, did uh, Loretta, did you have a dog or a cat growing up? I have always had dogs. Uh, I rescued my first dog when I was seven. I think from, uh, I mean, now what I know was a backyard breeder, um, but it was someone in our neighborhood and their dog had pups and the pups were sick and dying. And we mm. took one before she wasn't weaned. We bottle fed her. And that was the beginning of my animal rescue mission in life, I guess, was Lady, my Springer Spaniel. Oh, you, you started early on. Now, now, how about you, Terry? Did you have pets as a child? I did. I grew up with cats, dogs, and horses. Um, so I can attest to the benefit of all three. I'd say as a young kid, I would say I talked more to my cats. You know, they were much more present and able to hang with me and sleep on your chest and let you talk to them. And then high school age, my horse, that was my best friend. That My horse knew all my secrets. Um, nothing more calming than walking up to your horse and giving him a big hug and taking in that smell. Um, yeah, so I, I believe in the benefits of all different kinds of pets. Those are the three I have focused on. I know there's others out there, I suppose, but with those three, they're all three wonderful. And I have to yeah. chime in here because I also grew up exclusively with dogs. And then recently, like this past year, I got my own place. And just all of a sudden, I had this feeling kind of seep up in my consciousness. And it was like, you should get a cat. I'm like, where is this coming from? I've never had cats my whole life. And so I adopted two Siamese cats, of course, uh, none of them are, are conveniently close I'll, I'll grab one when they're <laughs> when they're nearby but now i'm like real i'm really learning the lessons of of cats because for me i always look at animals and i feel like they they share such like profound lessons and teachings with us just if you're like engaged with them and have observed them anyway i'm i'm going off at a tangent but i don't know if anyone else has experienced that but I, I'm no, totally, I, um, yeah. No, Becky, I don't think it's a tangent at all. <laughs> and um, I, I know I, in fact, the, I'm, I'm in my childhood home right now. And so I grew up with a dog who I just Cosmo loved that dog, only pet I had a until ultimately when I went to, I moved to the city, I moved to Washington, D.C. by myself. And I was just really stressed out. Uh, I went to a, a medical doctor for my stomach was hurt. And his prescription to me was get a cat. You are lonely. And that's what I did. I, so there was me and my cat in Washington, D.C. And it, that, that kitty cat certainly did make a difference in my life. I saw it, Cindy, it, that recently the CDC declared loneliness to be a public health crisis. That was very recent. 
Yeah. And if you, and if you have a pet to love, it, it, it helps you a lot. I, I know right now, uh, I've been away from my pets for about five days. And, um, I, I think that I miss them more than they miss me at this point. Yeah. I wanted to touch on something that Terry brought up that really there's all kinds of different animals that will bring uh, joy to you, that are comforting, that can help you to de-stress. Um, does anybody want to touch on that a little bit? Uh, other types other than your typical dogs, cats, horses. Where else can we go for this kind of comfort? I just have to laugh. I want to go back to Becky's comment about her cats. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's funny how I think there's more research on the dogs and the horses because they're a little bit more cooperative. There's Carly behind Loretta in the picture. They, you know, whereas Becky's trying to get her cats to come be present at this moment. They're not quite as biddable. So there's more research on those. But I think any animal, bird, Becky, or whatever that you are able as an individual to connect to is going to have some of those same benefits. In terms of, of other, uh, of the, the kitty cats, yes, that, that's why they came up with a saying, you can't, it's like trying to hurt a cat. Right, right. Now, so this is and, Phineas for, hello, if, if anyone's Phineas, watching. So good to see you. Phineas well, is a, a Lynx Point Siamese, and he's, he uh, runs this place, I don't know. Beautiful. <laughs> You know, and, and, and I had to adopt another one to because he's such a handful. So I had to get two. So the other well, they're, one they're, brothers they're, they're happier when when they've got somebody to play with sometimes. Yeah, I I don't know if I'll ever have just one again. It, it's so much better for them, and it's not it's not that much more effort. I don't think. And of course, now I've ended up with three. Um, <laughs> which is a little bit of a handful. And also they're pretty amazing. What I, and I'm sure you've observed through the years is that it's not just how the pet makes us feel, but it's how we bond together as human beings uh, as the result of our animals. And, and, you know, I've seen it on two different levels. Uh, I've seen it both when we're together like becky why don't you i know that you had noticed about when some people came up you know the big burly guys come up to ranger and they melt what did you observe about how it brought people together oh I, it's just like loretta said at the outset about going into the law school environments and how the students come over and it's just it's like barriers start naturally falling like people become more open and then they have this thing that they can immediately connect over in the moment so you know it's funny because obviously we are huge mindfulness proponents and i think that is something that animals are so incredible at is teaching us how to be in the moment uh, because oftentimes we're uh it's a little trickier for us. You know, we get into, we get caught up in the human doing instead of the human being. And I think animals like help us connect to that. So yeah, when we were at the conference, like, you know, this really like big guy, like Kim Orby's really, really tall. It kind of looked like intimidating. And he just went right over to Ranger and he thought he was like, Ranger was my dog because Ranger was leaning on me and like, <laughs> you know which i was loving and he's like oh can i pet your dog and i was like oh well he's not my dog but you can pet him and then we just started like waxing poetic because you know ranger is what what type of pointer is he loretta he's a german short-haired pointer german short hair yeah so ranger. i grew up with English ranger come here centers, which is like a long hair so here buddy oh yeah say hi Hi, there he is. She's a little ranger. Do you remember me? You probably don't hi. Voice. I think boy. he does. He's a good boy. <laughs> now, do, uh, Terry or Loretta, do you observe the same sort of thing? Do you observe uh, groups bonding or individuals bonding when you have your I, animals uh, in tow? 
I have an example, if you want it, that just I had Sam Wise at a conference and do the normal thing. I make sure I'm down there when the break happens and everyone floods up and pets on him and loves, talks to him. And a woman walked up with her friends and they all petted him. And then as the next session started, she remained. And, you know, of course, what happens is she meets Sam and asks me about it. And then she tells me about her dog. And next thing I know, she's we're both talking about previous dogs that we've had and how we love them. And next thing I know, that just rolls into she just lost a family member to suicide. And I was able to tell her about the uh, grief group that Loretta runs. And it's like, wow, it did not take very long for that. Hi, let me pet the cute dog to roll into a really significant. I just don't think people normally open up quite that quickly. But with the dog there, it just rolled right into it. It was fabulous. And she probably missed five minutes of her session and, you know, got a, got a information about a support group. We had a really serious conversation. So it's amazing how it opens the door. I just think people find you much more approachable when you have an animal with you. Absolutely. And I had a similar experience at a conference back when Kirby was still with us. Um, I had him at a judicial conference and a court staff member came up and actually started out by saying, you know, I'm not really a dog person, but then she started to pet him. And, and then she started to say, oh, I feel so much better already just petting him and then as she kept going this whole story of grief and loss came pouring out that I don't I don't think she even knew she needed to share she had bottled it up for so long mm -hmm. and all because she came over and didn't even identify that she was a dog person but something drew her over so they can do amazing things well, and, and, you know, it's not even just the in-person, uh, it's uh, how, how many times do I pick up my phone to show people pictures of my dog? Mm -hmm. And, and in fact, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, I was showing pictures of the dog and the cat and I ran across Becky's pictures of Becky's animals, which of course I always carry with me. And they were looking at, oh, what beautiful cats. And, and so indirectly, they, they really became fans of you, but we all just bond over this. And, and then with, um, you know, of course the, the horses, the cats, the dogs, but we've even done research and found that people feel there's not any major studies on this at this point in terms of birds that I know of. But one of oh, the uh, it's linked to happiness oh, is what okay. as bird watching is more so linked to happiness than like money. There are studies on this. I'm a big bird watcher. This is why I know this random factoid, but I've been. And I know the joke is that as you get older, you get into birds, like suddenly one day you're like, look how beautiful the birds are. This has been me my whole life. So. Well, I, I actually, can personally attest. I can yes. attest to Becky not only being a bird watcher, she knows whatever part of the country we're in together, she knows the birds that are there, uh, which I find to be absolutely amazing. It's Becky, when we're offline, I'll have to tell you about a great board game we have that is all about birds. Because we too, we, we became big bird watchers. Okay. Us, no. We became we big bird watchers, especially during the pandemic, because we were home and we're just so amazed at all the different kinds of birds that were in our yard that we never knew were there. Yeah. So yeah, there's this great board game called Wingspan. And oh, it's all about birds. And you, I mean, it's super complicated to play, but check it out. And I think there's, I think there's an online version, but you like each card has a picture of a bird and then uh -huh. facts about the bird, what kind of nest it builds. And so that's, that's also been a bonding experience. Not even, not even real birds, but we play this board game about birds with friends. Right. And then I'm sure that when you play that, then it's that's so cool because it's almost like, you know, akin to a formal meditation practice, because then I'm sure when you're outside, you're like primed and then you're in the moment like, oh, my gosh, 
like yesterday I was freaking out. I was on the phone with a friend and I was sitting on my couch, which like overlooks the woods. And I'm like, just sitting on the phone. I was like, oh my gosh, there's a Northern flicker outside right now. And <laughs> so I was like- I love Northern yeah. flickers. I know, they're so cool. <laughs> and so then of course I'm having to describe the bird. But anyway, the point being like, I think it really helps you again, connect to the present moment connect with nature, which, you know, we do know the studies that, you know, forest bathing, for example, getting out into nature that can really, really help our overall health and well-being. Um, And I think, you know, Cindy was going to say that I I know in in our coming article, part two, because we had so much to say about this topic, thanks to you ladies, we decided to, to do another article. But In the second edition, we'll really be talking about the legal workplace environment. And so, for example, um, a lot of people have integrated. So one thing we did want to talk to you about was maybe some of the challenges of bringing in, you know, the traditional therapy animals like dogs or horses, because we do know, you know, there might be allergies and stuff. And so when we were doing research, we found that actually, for example, fish in an office setting can be a really great way to promote that that well-being aspect the being in the present moment connecting with the animals but then like for example reducing the allergy risk but have you uh Lorette, i think you mentioned when we talked before that you did have that experience that you show up at a group nobody informed you about allergies so how did you deal with it I just, and that was a time, and I had driven probably two and a half hours, and I always ask, is anyone allergic? Is anyone afraid? You know, and, Mm -hmm. you know, this is a voluntary thing. I want to make sure everyone's comfortable. I get there, and someone is sitting in the front row and is allergic, and so I just, I kept Kirby in a downstay the entire time I was presenting, and Typically, when I took him places, if it was okay with people, he would just wander. And they had asked for him specifically, but then there's this person. So I, all I could do was just, I had, I had taken a dog bed with me and I had him lay on the bed while I presented. And then afterward, if people wanted to come interact with him, they could come up. But that was a little frustrating because they specifically asked and I drove all that way. But you just you just learn to roll with it. How, how about yeah. you, Terry? Have you had any unusual experiences? Thankfully, nothing unexpected. But I will say we had a JLAP therapy cat for a while. And we did take extra precautions because more people tend to be allergic to the cats than the dogs. And so we'd have the cat in a separate area, separate room. And the cat usually stayed in a carrier, although she could come out. She was a very friendly cat. Um, but she had a nice upright carrier up high where you could interact with her up there. But we, we you, know, you let people know there's a cat in this room because so many people are allergic. Um, thankfully, nobody's approached our therapy dogs or a- invited us in and then said that they had allergies. But it, it is a thought. Um, and I know the therapy dog uh, organizations now are really, I think they've really increased since COVID the amount of they want you wiping down the dog between people. Um, which won't help with allergies, but it does help with any spreading of germs from dog to dog or dog to people. Um, They're really paying more attention to that these days. But allergies, I think the only answer is avoidance. So I think, Loretta, you're doing all we can do, which is to ask in advance. You're inviting our dogs in. They are dogs. So if someone has allergies, they need to not participate um, and keep their distance. The fish thing... I'm not really a fish person, but I recently had someone talk to me about how watching his fish in the fish tank was so calming, almost a meditation practice for him. So I like with all self soothing methods, we all have to find what works for us. Right. And for this guy, he just thought the fish were wonderful. And that would be, I think, minimal allergy risk, I would think, with a fish tank. That's probably why doctor's offices have fish tanks in them. Right. Right. It's it's very soothing. And and it really surprised me as we were doing research for the article and said, well, let's see what they have to say if there's fish studies. And, and there are there are formal studies. 
And in fact, there is an attorney who it turns out I was friends with for a colleagues uh, in an organization I belong to out of San Diego for more than five years, Dennis Sandoval. He started having a, by, out by having one aquarium in his office, it grew so that he had over 16 aquariums in his office and he decided to start a business on, uh, on fish aquariums being put into law offices. So I thought that was pretty cool. So, uh, this anecdotal evidence, uh, is, is pretty compelling. And Cindy, mm -hmm. I feel like based on the research I saw that he might have started that business during the pandemic. So I just want to say he's, so. he's a total kindred spirit to us. Like, oh, let me start this like attorney well-being business amidst the pandemic. And like, you know, that's I think that's such a unique idea about yeah. about the aquariums. And I just have to speak to the point you raised, Terry, because so I'm, you know, for those who don't know, I am a certified contemplative practices teacher and Cindy and I, that is one of our biggest aims is to is to empower people, especially with, you know, these healthy tools and techniques, especially mindfulness things. But Terry, you hit the nail on the head when you said you got to find what works for you. And there's so many different mindfulness practices, meditation practices, and what works for me, what works for Loretta, what works for Cindy, they might be completely different. So that was such a, a critical point that it's like, you know, maybe, maybe you're not a dog person. Although I was laughing when you said that, Terry, that you're not a fish person based on the prior story about I'm not a dog person. It's like, I'm not a fish person. It's like five hours later. <laughs> Oh, it's so beautiful watching this fish. <laughs> yeah, there's even Howie the Crab on, on uh, ha who has his own YouTube. It's people apparently will just so, tune into Howie every day, see what Howie's up to and his various antics. And, and you know, isn't it all just about feeling better? Just having a little bit of stress release. And laughs, they they bring so much laughter, at least my animals. I don't know about y'all, but laughter is oh, totally Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Terry, have you seen, you know, I know we've talked uh, previously about the different types of settings that uh, in, in, within the legal community that we see dogs. And you, you mentioned that, uh, that sometimes it just happens informally. Uh, w w can you speak to that as to how these informal arrangements start happening in an office setting? Yeah, I mean, for us it's happened where I've brought Sam in because we're going to go over to the law school for an hour, whatever, at some point in the day. But then I have meetings, right, during the day. So Sam, if invited, my staff's good, they'll stay with him if I need them to. But I'll ask, hey, I've got a, a meeting, a manager's meeting or whatever. Can I bring my, is it okay if my dog, therapy dog comes in? And the meetings, when I think back, the meetings do go really well when he's there. And I've read some of the studies that say having a dog present encourages people to trust to interact, you know, just to be more pro-social generally. And when I think about it, the meetings he's gone to, he'll poke a few people and get them to pet him. It's pretty quiet, but he'll know somebody and they'll pet him a little bit. And it does seem to keep the cooperative, collegial atmosphere going in the meeting. Um, I also read where more law firms are having bring your dog to work day, which of course is not always therapy dogs, but it's bring your own dog in and kind of experimenting with what does that do to the culture in the office, which my guess would be they will see more interaction between humans as well as the interaction with the dogs. Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting just to interject for a moment. At, at my dog uh, groomer's uh, office, there is a sign that said, be the person your dog thinks you are. And maybe that's why people might be a little better behaved. So I was recently, just to interject here, I was um, recently reading about, I don't know if you're familiar with this, it's a personality framework called OCEAN is the acronym. And it's <gasps> supposedly it's more accurate than like the big five 
Uh, or I'm sorry, it's called the Big Five. It's more accurate than Myers Briggs, supposedly. Uh -huh. But anyway, the acronym OCEAN stands for openness to new experiences, conscientiousness, um, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. And I was reading uh, a couple articles recently about the characteristics of dog people versus cat people. I'm putting this in air quotes uh, for anyone not watching. And it said that dog people were higher on agreeableness. Uh, so that's that's just really interesting to hear about in the in the setting, you know, the meeting setting that <clears throat> you're saying it seems to promote, uh, you know, kind of this mediation effect. Like, so I wonder if that's also speaking to the personality of those types of people. And for the record, the cat people were higher on neuroticism. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll raise my oh, arm. <laughs> then those of us who are both, I guess, some kind of split personalities. Uh, <laughs> what are we going on here? Well, and I That's wonder if that has something to do with mirror neurons, that if the dog comes in the room with that calming Friendly. demeanor, that the humans respond to that. I, I love that. Okay. Pinging off of Loretta with the mirror neurons, if people react to the dog with smiles and trust and enjoyment, then if, even if the people don't ping off the dog's expression, they ping off the other people's expressions. Oh, that's good. That That is very cool information. Yay, neuroscience. And <laughs> <laughs> and, and if we're and if we're gonna have animals in the work setting, uh, like like let's say that we have the office dog, the office cat, um, which there was a period of probably about four or five years that I had an office cat at my small law firm, and what we did is we just notified when clients were coming in as they were coming in for the meetings, we would say we do have an office cat, we want to check on allergies, and uh, people were very receptive even when the dog or excuse me the cat would jump up in the client's lap even better um yeah. it seemed that's 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 a way to get to know your lawyer for sure <laughs> well i would just also like to circle back to something becky said early on about how much we can learn from our animals I think it's relevant here and so Neville who is not in the room with us right now but Neville came to us right before the pandemic and he was rescued from a neglect situation he was part of a large group of dogs cattle and horses that were pulled from a big neglect situation and so he came to us very traumatized and fearful and shut down and because then the pandemic happened and we were home with him every day, just to get to see him every day be a little bit braver and a little less scared and start to act like a dog, it's very hopeful. I mean, when, when I look at how really without the power of language, he has been able to overcome so much then I think there there's hope for me whatever I'm going through or you know my husband will say oh yeah if if Neville can overcome his trauma then I can overcome whatever I'm going through and so I think that's a, a thing that we don't always think about is if you spend a lot of time with an animal we can learn so much from them and, and definitely about the mindfulness. I mean, they are very present. They don't hold a grudge. They don't think about the past. They aren't worrying about tomorrow. They are here in the moment. They are using their senses. They're sniffing around. They're rolling on things. I mean, they, they can teach us so much about being present. Well, and about being forgiving. Um, uh, I know from time to time, I'll step on Rocky's tail. And that's my dog. And and at first he kind of is 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 taken aback. And then he'll look at who it was. And it's like, oh, that's mommy. It's my dog, mommy. She didn't mean it. And he'll start then wagging his tail and be happy. So he, he forgives my transgressions so quickly if we could only all uh, live like that. 
And also, well, you know, one of the you- things that we talked about at Solo Small Firm, we had a session about um, Brene Brown's whole concept of our people doing the best they can with what they have in the moment. And I think if you look at animals, yeah, that's how they that's how they approach us. Even Neville, who came from such horrible mistreatment, still looks at humans and for the most part is making an assumption that the humans are doing the best they can. And I, can I just say, Lor- Loretta, that story brought tears to my eyes because as you were saying, just how Neville is this symbol of hope and then, you know, it translates in terms of hope for you and your well-being and your healing. I just think that's so powerful. I was like tearing up and just it just makes me think also of, you know, I know we're all kindred spirits here and this this broader mission of really trying to reach people. And it's like, yeah, you've gone through this trauma, you've gone through this experience and maybe, you know, you've got some unhealed stuff and you it's sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you can get really triggered, but it's like, you know, you didn't throw Neville away. Like you, you gave this animal a chance. Like it, you showed like, Hey, it's okay to not be okay. We still love you. We accept you, you know, we're here for you. And then to just give him that space and that time and that support, and then to see the magic happen, to see him come out of that, come into his own, heal that past trauma. I think that is, that's just such a powerful message for what we can do for people. Right. And Absolutely. I think Absolutely. Is- and for ourselves. Because yes. we got to do it for ourselves first or we can't yeah. do it for others. So he's a great reminder for me that, oh, it's okay for me to let somebody else help me. Yeah. And it's super hard. It's super hard to do it. It's super hard to ask for it. But that he reminds me that it's okay and that I never begrudge him the things I have to do for him. And just like that, my my friends and my family want to help me, support me. So he's, I've learned so much from him, even though he's, I think because of his trauma, he probably won't ever be the therapy dog that goes out and interacts with people. Um, I've learned so much from him and he does really love when I teach yoga. And so sometimes he comes in the room when I teach yoga and for a while people, if he didn't come in would say, where's Neville? Why isn't he here? Cause I teach yoga on zoom. So he can just be in the room with me, but the other, like, like we talked about earlier, it isn't always in person. They would just, they would love to watch him lay down on the mat while I taught yoga. Little downward dog action. Yeah. And as we know, you know, launching this business during the pandemic and we were all virtual, the energy absolutely translates. So, you know, I, I think give Neville more credit, even though he's not going out there. Yeah. In the world, he's still functioning in that exact same oh, yeah. capacity. That is so special. Now, Loretta, can you. And he tell renews me so I can do this work. Exactly. He's, so, he's, yes, he is like a critical piece. And then also like supporting your other animals who are going out there. Like, <laughs> now, can you tell us who is sitting behind you for our interview? So that is Carly. She is the youngest she could possibly be is about 14. She is an English what? pointer, also a rescue And we've had her since she was about one. And she was, I mean, you've met Ranger and you've seen what a bundle of energy Ranger is. She was very much like that when she was younger. Uh, She spends most of her time doing this, sleeping right now. Um, Although usually when I get on Zoom, she comes in and starts barking. So I'm kind of surprised that she's still back there sleeping. But And she's wearing a sweatshirt. Yes, she is. Because she's always cold. And she has learned about the fireplace. And if the fireplace isn't on, she will go up and look at it and paw at the glass doors and look at me and bark like, hey, it's time to have a fire. (laughs) So she's a princess. As they should be. In fact, I I know that uh, Terry had related a story to me when we were uh, speaking about a month ago about um oh terry you'll tell it better about that that people wanted the dog but didn't make reference to you oh absolutely 
um, I don't know how many of my neighbors, they know Sam's name. Oh, yeah, I think what I told you was it was a law student called our office because the dean of students had suggested he call us and he's talking to me and I'm explaining who we are and that it's confidential. And he says, oh, well, I met this big red dog. I think that was from JLab. And I said, well, if you met a big red dog at the law school, then you met me because I come with him. And I think, oh, you met Gus, but you also met me. But I know I am secondary. Absolutely. Hey, I did think of another lesson they teach lawyers too. Lawyers are not always good about resting. You know, we're always talking to lawyers that you can work hard, you can do hard things, but you do need to rest and recover. And think about these dogs, particularly the younger ones like Ranger and Sam that like to play and play hard. Sam will play Frisbee, I mean, hard, fast for a long time, but then he naps, right? I mean, he's really, really active and then he rests. And I think lawyers can learn from that, that you can do hard things, you can work hard, but then you need to rest. Yes. Yeah. Yet we try to deny our nature, mm -hmm. and 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 the the animals don't know how to deny their nature. They accept their nature, and so we need to learn to do the the same thing. But then, to your point about that, your neighbors know the dog uh, better than they know you. Um, Absolutely, you're, you're and I know my neighbors mom. that way. Yep, I know that's Bella's mom. I don't know her name, but I know her, and I. And I have a relationship with her, even though I may not know her name, we have this ongoing relationship and I would, you know, rely on her to help me with something. I think she'd rely on me, even though all we know is our dog's names, <laughs> but it does help build that trust. I've absolutely, that, I've absolutely met, made connections with my neighbors because of our animals. So one of my close friends that lives right behind me when I moved here, um, she has a little miniature dachshund and Lucy was only like, you know, three months old. So she's like this big. And I, of course, went over to introduce myself to the dachshund. And now that's one of my closest friends. And I know um, it's so funny. I'll send this to Michelle. Hey, Michelle. And but I know she got Lucy because she was really needing to get out there. She lives by herself, lives alone. You know, we'd gone through the pandemic. It's very isolating. And so she wanted a dog because she really wanted to get out there to take those daily walks. And she has talked about how it's just really benefited her, her physical health, her mental health. She's like, I've lost a bunch of weight. You know, my, like, she just feels so much better, her mental clarity. And then like we're saying, it also facilitates those human connections, which we need to. And and I gotta say, you're so right, Terry, about the resting, because that's uh, that's one of the lessons that I I take from the cats is they they do give you a lesson about daily naps are good. <laughs> yeah, I'm all over it, and it and it took me a while to accept that I need rest. Because I um, used to go a million miles an hour, and I'm much happier now that I take time for myself. And in fact, my dog and cat and I just nap together. I think that's the way of the world. And I think not just rest, but animals just ask for what they need. They're in tune with what they need. You know, if if it's five after six and I haven't fed the dog, Carly's going to let me know. You know, how many times do we talk to lawyers or, or how many times do we say, oh, I forgot to eat <laughs> or, you know, I, I noticed that I'm hungry, but I'm going to push through. No, they ask for what they need when they need to take a break and go outside. They ask for what they need. And that's, that's a really hard thing I find for humans to do. And they are, animals are great examples of that, that they are so in touch with their body and what their body needs. And if they can access it themselves, they will. And if they need help, they're going to ask for it. And they're yeah. going to oh, keep well, asking they, they... until they, until they get it. They're not just, Oh gonna, like, yes, they are. Ask once and, and, and they... then, you know, shy away. <laughs> yeah. Right, not like, Oh, if you don't mind, they're like, Oh no, now. <laughs> yeah. Ro Rocky, the, the dog, Every morning after uh, his walk, he likes to he likes to play, and that's what we do. We have playtime. And if I'm busy and maybe I have an early appointment, 
then if I haven't done the play, he will come, uh, he will bring his toys and start hitting me in these big dog, big toys. He will start hitting me in the leg. And, and so it's, yeah, so it's, it's expressing very distinctly what he wants. So does anybody have any parting words before we start the wrap up? Um, I, one point I'd like to make is, is um, about uh, changing lawyer culture in terms of what we do in our, even as a group in, in our to de-stressed. You know, it's been traditional, oh, let's go drink at happy hour. Let's go meet at a bar. Well, instead, why not take a little field trip to the zoo? go to an aquarium and and in in the long run well even in the short run you're going to feel a lot better so do you have any other tips or topics that you'd even like to bring up well i think to piggyback on that another great thing to do is why don't we all go to the animal shelter and walk dogs yeah. they're always looking for volunteers to do that that's another great thing that people can do together to socialize that doesn't necessarily involve drinking. Perfect. I love that suggestion. That's a great one, Loretta. I may bring you any other suggestion. Well, I was just saying, I may add the going to the shelter. Our, the court has added, you can take a public service. You get one day of public service. And then, so I was organizing some outings. So it would be easier for people to use their day of service. And one of the things we did was go volunteer at the zoo and it was very popular and people love being there. We made toys for the animals. So we were all working together. It was looked like a kindergarten class, putting together all these fun toys with cardboard and construction paper and feed sacks and put them all together. And then we got to go deliver them to the animals. It was a good day, building connections among people. Plus you got to see the animals. I'm thinking walking the dogs at the shelter would be another great group activity to take your coworkers, and you know you can go do it for i mean walk the dogs go take a couple hours and go do that it wouldn't have to be a full day i think that'd be a great activity for you'd enjoy the walking the dogs but also enjoy connecting with those colleagues in a different sort of way and even get outside which would have even more benefit um, which yeah instead of always let's go to the bar and have a drink getting outside taking a bike ride going to the zoo um you're doing something with your kids, perhaps that's kid friendly for families. I think there's lots of options and not we can go to and avoid that just default. Let's go to the bar next door to the office all the time, which I think happens because it's quick and easy and requires no thought. Um, but with a little bit of effort, we can find much better ways to connect. It's what's comfortable and what we're accustomed to. And that for me in in the couple of years that I've been really focusing on well-being in the legal profession, like that's the hard thing to get people to to change from that groove that we've, you know, worn into the ground. And how do we really start to take care of ourselves and believe that that's important? And one of the things that we talk about, and in fact, we're going to be doing an upcoming CLE entitled "Well-being in the Legal Profession." Is it oxygen, aspirin, or bling? So is it something that we have to have to live? Is it something that we think of when we have a headache or a backache? Or is it something that's nice to have? And what I've seen over the past, you know, gosh, 10, 11 years that I've been with JLAP and then doing this work, I think when I started at JLAP, well-being wasn't even bling. It was like nobody knew what it was. So we've at least moved the needle to where now it's bling. People talk about it. It's a nice to have. Maybe we've got some people thinking about it as aspirin, but how do we really get them to think of it as oxygen, as something that we really need? And I think that ties right back to what we can learn from animals. They know. They know the deal. They know that it's oxygen. I love that observation. Yeah, and I just want to say thank thank you both so much. And you know, to this point about changing culture, 
And that that's exactly what we're doing here. And I, I truly believe that, you know, it, it takes these individual, right? We created, we created the legal field so we can, we can create new pathways. Like you're saying, Laura, it, again, it makes me think of, um, you know, neural pathways, right? Like every time we're, we're flexing that muscle, we're exercising in, oh, let's go do that outing. Um, you know, I, I can just imagine, I'm just trying to think if I were still in the law firm setting, like the big law firm setting and how different that would have been to go do an event like we're talking about where it's like, let's go volunteer at the zoo or let's go do a family friendly event where, you know, we're going and volunteering at the animal shelter. And I'm just thinking how like, I would just be over the moon at that. And if that became like, and then I would be like, dogged about it. like when are we going back you know I can like people would be excited I would be excited and I I just I just think there's so much like creative like way here like that we can we you know like you said Terry it just takes a little bit of effort but we can implement these like really really cool ways to connect with each other to connect with ourselves so I just want to say like thank you to you both for doing this work and and being these thought leaders and I mean Loretta you're at thought kitchen so it's perfect that you're a thought leader and yeah thank, thank you so much again for for being with us here and and sharing this wisdom I feel like this has been so packed full this conversation has been so packed full of wisdom so thank you ladies again for being with us Thank you for having us. Of course. And Terry, do you have any closing tips you'd like to give before we begin to sign off? Just keep doing the good work. It is culture change, so it takes some time, but we're we're seeing the needle move. So stick with it. I, I, I love this. And, and one last thought about pets. We talk about them in, with our self-care, but we also need to think about their care. And that as we're choosing our pets to make sure that they're ones that we're able to provide the care for and to know exactly what we're getting ourselves into. We see so also often that at, around Easter, the, the rabbits that get adopted and then two months later, they're thrown into the woods and which isn't fair to anybody. And also uh, my, my background as an attorney was in estate planning and elder law. And we had, we did pet trusts. And so we always encouraged people with uh, pets to uh, include them in their estate plan, name a guardian, uh, set up, you know, a willing guardian, and set up a trust uh, to pay for their needs in the event that, that something happens to us. Well, I want to, to, to any of us, well, I do want to thank, uh, I want to thank, first of all, my wonderful and awesome partner, Beth for uh, being to, uh, on this podcast, my Indiana buds, Loretta and Terry. And if uh, out in the audience, if you haven't had the chance to explore the services offered by Answering Legal, then you're going to want to make that time right now. And while you're at it, check out the information that Becky and I offer for free at LegalBurnout.com. Uh, you're going to want to get on our blog. You'll see the articles that we've written, not only in the area of uh, animals and mental health, but an array of other topics. Well, this is Becky Hallett and Cindy Sharp, your co-hosts. And until we meet again... Just, Just breathe. Breathe. <laughs> <laughs>